is a blessing to be here with you this evening. I want to thank the Lord. This is uh, my first opportunity to come to Kingdom Works, although we have sent uh, staff here and a uh, number of friends have come over the years. It's been a blessing to know many of the people who put this together. I'm just so grateful to God to be able to share this evening. And we just have a wonderful time with Sister Cantaloupe. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here didn't recognize yourself in at least one or two of those places. Amen? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. My thanks to God for the privilege of being alive today. I want to thank uh, Bart and Marty and all of the staff uh, who are responsible for putting this together. And I want to especially thank you, you the people who work with young people throughout this country. You the folks who are on that front line. And I know that your work is often not appreciated, not affirmed in the way that it ought to be, even though we know that once you get past the age of 18, you've got about a 6% chance of making your first commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that you are the ones who are really bringing into the kingdom those people who are going to persist. And even though those who fall away, a lot of them are going to make it back. Amen. After the devil beats them up for a little while. Amen. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Hallelujah. You're gonna, they're going to go through that phase when they're going to do everything they think they're big enough and bad enough to do. And then somehow Jesus is going to look a whole lot better. Amen? So I really want to thank you for the work that you do because your faithfulness really sows the seeds uh, that allows the kingdom of God to become what God has called it to be. I want to thank the Lord for the choir that was here tonight. Amen. Let's give God the praise. And I really want to bless the Lord for the way in which they really work together. It's especially incredible given the amount of time that they had. Uh, amen. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the kind of role that uh, music ministry can play. But it's not, always a, it's not always a good one. One of the things the pastors always talk about is the devil getting into the choir. Amen. There's a church where they were having some trouble between the preacher and uh, the choir on one occasion. And uh, it began to spill over into the worship service. So on one occasion, the pastor decided he would preach on commitment, how we ought to dedicate ourselves to service, at which point the choir got up and sang, I shall not be moved. <laughs> Next Sunday, the pastor decides he's going to preach on giving and how we should gladly give to the work of the Lord, at which point the choir, like Sister Cantaloupe said, Jesus paid it all. Following Sunday, he decided he would preach on gossiping and how we should watch our tongues, at which point the choir got up and sang, I love to tell the story. <laughs> About time now, the preacher's getting kind of upset by all of this, and so he told the congregation that he was considering resigning, at which point the choir got up and sang, oh, why not tonight? Finally, the pastor said, this is it. I'm, I'm through with it. I've had as much of this as I can bear. So he decides to resign. Following week, informs the congregation, is preaching his last sermon when he declares, I want you to know that Jesus brought me here and Jesus is taking me away. At which point the choir concluded with, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I thank God for the spirit of unity and cooperation that's here tonight. Amen. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, challenge you with a word from the book of Matthew. Encourage you with a word from the book of Matthew. I ask you to think about your ministry and where you are in the light of a word from the book of Matthew. As you turn to that chapter, Matthew, the 26th chapter, and I'd like us to just read this together. I also want to thank the Lord for my family who were kind enough to allow me to come, especially my wife, my co-labor in ministry. We've been married 27 years, eight months, and three days. Amen. Hallelujah. And to my daughters have taught me so much. I just bless God. I want to ask you to look at this word from Matthew, the 26th chapter, and we want to look at these verses, verses 26 through 30. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it, he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks and he offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. 
When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Particular verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. I just want to ask you to think tonight with me on this subject. Blessed, broken, and given away. Blessed, broken, given away. Turn to somebody and tell them, blessed, broken, and given away. Tonight we're turning to the Gospel of Matthew. In the passage which we've just read, what is established for us is a model and a rationale for the communion sacrament that many of us are going to engage in tomorrow. Maybe the tradition in your church as it is in mine on that first Sunday of the month to observe the Lord's Supper. In this passage we see with some real power what was happening in that last fellowship, this side of the cross, that Jesus had with his disciples. I want you to think about the setting and the time. It's Passover, one of the highest and holiest of days in the Jewish calendar. And, and, and it should have been, because when you think about it, it was on this day that the people of Israel commemorated the incredible, the miraculous, the awesome deliverance that God had brought to their situation of bondage. They didn't ever want to forget that their nationhood and their peoplehood and their identity was a direct result of God's intervention and God's grace and God's love. And so God said, every year I want you to celebrate this so that you never forget where you've come from. But the amazing thing is that we also understand that Jesus is doing something else here. He's helping his disciples to see in him the fulfillment of what that covenant first established between God and the people of Israel was like. And so it is that he says of the bread, this is my body. Uh, I ran across uh, some, uh, a passage written by Moish and Seal Rosen. It really was striking to me. They said, not only were the words of Jesus saying here shocking, it was an unusual act. For usually after the supper, no other food was eaten. Jesus did something new here. He was teaching his disciples in very, very concise terms that after his death, the lamb that they ate would have a new significance. He wanted them to remember that this was not only a memorial of physical and historical redemption, but it was just a shadow of the ultimate redemption that was soon to come. He was about to become the better sacrifice once and for all. And he said he would do it with his own body. Now that, that's true and that's right. And as a church and as a people, what, what we know, what we believe, what we are rooted in is that the death of Jesus was what they call substitutionary. Tell somebody, substitutionary. That's because when Jesus died, it meant I didn't have to. I don't know about you, but that's good news. I, I don't know about you, but I, I tried in a number of cases to do myself in, amen? Thought I was having a good time, enjoying a good thing, right? Didn't know that death was lurking around the corner. But the grace of it all was that because he died, I didn't have to. Didn't have to, didn't have to, didn't have to. Because Jesus died, our sin debt to God was canceled and cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Now, now, that's what Jesus did for us. For the cross was the place where the love of God dealt with the justice of God. One of the reasons I was really getting here today was because we had a major meeting at our church and uh, we had come together because we were concerned about some raids that had taken place in the prisons. And some of you know in the work that we've been involved with, we, we've said in a heartbeat, anybody who violates the security of our community really has to be put away. And as a preacher, I'll be the first one to go to court and say, for your sake and for the sake of the victim who may come about, I I'm willing to have you locked down. But, but it also means that when you are locked down, I'm going to make sure that you're treated like a decent human being. And, and I'm looking to your restoration and your rehabilitation. You're, you're not somebody to be beat on. So, so uh, we were here because we wanted to see that justice was done. But you know, one of the wonderful things I've discovered is that when it comes to dealing with God, I never want him to give me justice. Amen? No, no, I, I don't want what I deserve. That, that's what grace is all about. God's riches at Christ's expense. Not what I deserve, but what I need. Not, not what I deserve. Not... God, please don't give me what I deserve. Amen? I know I, 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 know I rate it, but, but God, don't give me what I deserve. Have mercy on me. And, and the grace of God, 
is that by the blood of Jesus Christ, we find access to that mercy of God. On the crosses, it was his body that was scorched by the withering heat of unjust accusation, the torture of pain, and the agony of separation. There under the wings of the Savior, the broken Savior, our deliverance was determined, our salvation was secured, and our atonement was attained. Now, and I want you to think through this Last Supper, because I want to suggest that Jesus is also teaching us something else here. And, 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 and I heard this from a, a pastor who had shared it, who had heard it from a great teacher and preacher of the gospel in West Africa named Mensa Otabani. He, he went on to suggest, and, and when, I, when I thought about this, I said, oh God, this is, this is so true, this is so powerful. That what God does, what Jesus does there in that communion sacrament is the same thing that God does in each and every one of our lives. Everybody whom God is going to use for the work of his kingdom. In other words, in the life of every committed man or woman of God, no matter how public or private their ministry, whether they're ordained or lay, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, 8 or 80, 15 or 50, no matter what their situation, if they're going to be instruments of God's will, just like the communion bread, they've got to be blessed, and they've got to be broken, and they've got to be given away. That's what God's got to do with you. That's what God has to do with me. Blessed, broken, given away. Now, now if, you don't, if you don't think I'm serious about that, I want you to think about the saints of old. They were blessed. They were blessed. They were, there were some like Abraham and Job, blessed with wealth, a beautiful family, and the favor of God. They, they were blessed like Jacob and the apostle Paul with a golden tongue and a quick mind. They were blessed like Joseph and John the Baptist with gifts of knowledge and wisdom and prophecy and a sense of destiny from a young age. They were blessed like Moses and Samuel and Daniel with godly and courageous parents and deliverance from death at an early age and opportunities to study at the great universities of their day. They were blessed like Deborah and Esther and Ruth with strength and beauty and the ability to overcome the barriers and be women of excellence and courage in a man's world. They were blessed like Joshua and Hannah and Mary with the gift of patience and faith. So they were able to see God do the miraculous in their life. They were blessed, blessed, blessed of God who could proclaim that their lives were something like what one child described in the elevator. I got into this room and upstairs came down. <laughs> Woo! I stepped in this room. I, I walked through the door of salvation and the upstairs of God came down. The windows of heaven opened up and a blessing got poured out more than I could contain. I am blessed. I don't bless. I, I don't know why it happened. I know that I didn't merit it. It has something to do with the grace of God. But I'm blessed. Blessed, blessed. But those same saints, if you think about it, were also broken. They were also broken. You, you ask Daniel, ask Daniel, ask him what it was like to watch your nation defeated, what it was like to see its warriors slain, what it was like to see your people starved and your temple desecrated. Ask Daniel what it's like to go from Israelite prince to Babylonian hostage and slave in a short time. Ask Daniel what it's like to be a minority student in the University of Babylon. You ask Daniel what it's like to have your name changed from Daniel, which means God is my judge, to Belteshazzar, a name which entreats an unknown pagan deity to protect his life. You talk about a slave name, ask Daniel what it's like. Brokenness? Ask Ruth what it's like to bury your father-in-law, your brother-in-law, and your own husband. Ask Ruth what it's like to know that God is calling you to a foreign land and a foreign culture. Ask her how it feels when those you love and want to help and be with tell you to go away and leave them alone to their own misery and hurt. Ask Ruth what it's like to break into a community as an alien, what it's like to depend on the handouts and the welfare appropriations of others. Ask Ruth what it's like to be broken. Ask Paul what it's like to be saved and have people believe that you haven't really changed. Ask Paul what it's like when your fellow saints are suspicious or jealous or downright cold toward you. Ask Paul what it's like to go from being a man of authority and standing in the highest circles to spending three years in the Arabian desert. Ask Paul what he was talking about when he said, five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times 
since I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from the rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles. I was in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from the false brothers. I've labored and I've toiled. I've gone without sleep. I've known hunger. I've known thirst. And I've often gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for the church. They were blessed, but they also knew what it was to be broken. Broken. Broken, 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 broken. And then that's when they discovered that that God would give them a way spread their gifts and their callings and their talents and their children and their intellects and their love and their service all around. Now, it's no different now than it was then. It's just, just not any different. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And you and I aren't going to get around God's way. See, because see, see, we're blessed. Hey, we're in this gathering. Nobody here is exempted. As a body of people, we have been blessed. Blessed, 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 blessed. Blessed, 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 blessed. I, uh, first time I really came home for me was 1990. I, I, I was on a trip, uh, and I'd been asked to come by an, uh, my former pastor to, to Liberia. Got off the plane, saw a country in the early stages of a civil war, soldiers everywhere. Every time we would drive out into the countryside, checkpoints to go past. Uh, we went from there to another land and another country, and, and as we were there in Cote d'Ivoire, I saw some saints whose average income was $110 a year. The, the, they said, man, let me tell you, we, we don't have much, but we, we know how to pray. And we told God we wanted to do some things. We told him that we needed a, a school for our children, so we just saw what was in the offering after every week. Had enough for one brick. Bought the brick, put it down on the space, and said, God, multiply the bricks. Sunday after Sunday, bought one brick at a time until we had a room. Then we said, God, we need a teacher. Wait until God sent somebody who said, I don't know why I'm here, but, but somehow I'm here and I've, I'm able to teach. He said, and we just saw God do an amazing thing with our $110 a year. And I said, Lord, would you please forgive me if I ever complain? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. We're, we're, we're blessed because God woke us up this morning and started us on our way. We're, we're blessed because we're part of a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who brought us out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. We're blessed because we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And we're new creatures, not all that we need to be, not all that we want to be, but thank God we're not what we used to be. We're blessed. We're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed. Inheritors of a great legacy of faith and overcoming. And our ancestors came to this country, many by choice and some in chains. And though they arrived here often bereft of rights and forfeit of family, we refused to quit, they refused to die, refused to stop dreaming and hoping and singing and celebrating and resisting and passing on to the next generation their prayers for freedom and a nation that was truly under God. We're blessed. And you know, if you want to get me upset, Tell me we ain't made no progress. <laughs> no, no, no. See, we, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll contain myself, amen. I won't even be nasty toward you. Even though I think you disrespect the blood and the sweat shed by our ancestors. That's okay. I'm going to get past that. I'm just going to assume you don't know better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that somehow you've lost contact. I'm going to assume that, that, that you don't remember the day. I remember the days when you crossed the Chesapeake Bay and there was a colored toilet and a white toilet and a colored fountain and a white fountain. I remember when you didn't get an Adam's Mark ballroom. You can't tell me that we're not blessed. blessed to be able to work with a generation that's going to do awesome things for God. Awesome things for God. The devil's doing everything he can to throw roadblocks in their way, challenges in their pathway, but God is going to do some amazing things 
with this generation. We're blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed. But you know what this evening? We're also broken. Some of us are broken by financial difficulty. Some of us are broken by divorce and grief and illness, loss of relationship and insecurity, uncertainty, sometimes by defeat. <laughs> We've trained ourselves to put on a happy face, keep a stiff upper lip, and reply, I'm just fine. But we have some broken places in our life. It's a story told by our weeping that endures more than a night. It's told by our touchiness around certain subjects. It's, a, it's the buttons that are so easily pushed and our behavior under stress at the job and school. We're, we, we know something about brokenness. We're broken because we're trying to put other families back together and our own families are sometimes struggling. We're, we're, we're broken. We're broken. We're broken. We're broken. We're broken. We're broken. I, 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 Remember a few years ago, I, I was saying, you know, I, I'm out here working with young people on the streets. I've got two nephews who are going nuts. They're going wild. So my wife and I decided we would take a step of faith and invite them to come into our homes. Never had. The 14-year-old, by the time he came, had moved 14 times already in his life. Had called seven different women mother. But, but, but God, you can do anything. You can do anything. And so, so we're going, to invite them, we're going to invite them in our home. And we saw the changes. But what we didn't understand is sometimes when love has been denied you for a long time, it's a scary thing to actually find somebody coming up on you with love. It, it's a scary thing. So, so before it was all over, after a few months, the, the, the one who we thought there was a breakthrough suddenly in a week's time turned around and said, I want to become a foster child. And, and we watched him walk away. And then we got the call when he was shot on Halloween night throwing eggs at the car of a local drug dealer. And then we were there when he got bailed out of the hospital. And th th then, then we heard about the murder case that he was involved in. And we watched for the 18 months while he was in jail. And then, then, when, then his brother got the same thing, shot on the opposite side of the body. Both of them inches away from their heart. Both of them discharged from the hospital within six hours. And we said to ourselves, can't you understand the enemy wants to kill you? And it was overwhelming. And before we knew it, both of them ended up in prison. There was nothing that I can remember more painful than watching that boy walk off with shackles around his ankles. And the judge saying, we'll see you in six years, maybe. We know something about brokenness in this room. Broken because we're wrestling with some of the same temptations that we're trying to keep young people away from. We're wrestling with some of this. We're, we're, we're struggling in our sexual lives. We're, we're, we're struggling with the materialism thing ourselves. We're struggling with the peer pressure and, and, and the stuff from the families. And we're still struggling with the childish stuff that it's still hard to put away, the stuff that mama used to say and daddy used to say. We're broken because we know that outside these doors there's a world that's different from this beautiful ballroom. We know there's another part of Philadelphia and another part of America. We know that there are those growing number of households struggling to make ends meet with parents, often single mothers, striving to hold themselves and their families together while they try to raise boys who will not become fodder on the killing fields called urban streets and daughters who will not grow old before their time. We're broken because we know too many of those 13 children who were murdered every day and the 62 who were wounded by guns and the 280 who are arrested for crimes of violence and the 3,000 who drop out of school and the 2,400 babies that are born into poverty every day. We're broken because we've been too long sometimes in communities that we watch come apart at the seams under the strain of all that's going on around them, including a nation that invests too little in those who are on the margins. We're broken because trustees and stewards and elders don't always understand why we spend all this time and energy on young people who don't contribute to the offering. Broken because there are funders and supporters who have good intentions but bad grants. We're broken because we've been doing too much with too little for so long. We know what brokenness is about. But I got 
got good news for you today. Good news, good news, good news. There's something different about what God does with your brokenness. That, that's why James could write in the first chapter, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> Is he on crack? <laughs> Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance has got to finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything, not lacking anything, not, not lacking anything. Hebrews put it this way, chapter 12, verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, now, very quickly, I just want to tell you that there's a brokenness, but, but God allows that brokenness for at least two reasons. First, he wants to burn out the impurities in your life. He wants to burn them out. 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 He wants to burn out the impurities. And then he wants to bring out the faith and the testimony in you. He wants to burn out the impurity and bring out the faith. Bring out the faith. Burn it. Burn it. Bring out the impurity. I, I ran across a story one time about a woman visiting in Switzerland. Came to a sheepfold on one of her daily walks. She went in. She saw the shepherd seated on the ground with his flock around him. On a pile of straw nearby, there was a single sheep whose leg was broken. Sympathy went out to the suffering sheep. She looked up to the shepherd and she asked, how did it happen? The shepherd said, I broke it. I broke it. I broke it. Of all the sheep in my flock, this one was the most charismatic and also the most wayward. It would not obey my voice. It wouldn't follow when I was leading the flock. On more than one occasion, it wandered to the edge of a cliff and almost went over. And not only was it disobedient and dangerous to itself, but it was leading other sheep to the cliff. So, so based on my experience with this kind of sheep, I knew I had no choice, so I broke its leg. The next day I took food and it tried to bite me. After letting it lie alone for a couple days, I went back and it not only took the food, but licked my hand and showed signs of submission and affection. And, and let me tell you this, when this sheep is well, it'll be the best sheep in my flock. No sheep will hear my voice so quickly nor follow so closely. Instead of leading the others away, it'll be an example of devotion and obedience. A complete change will come into the life of this wayward sheep. It will have learned obedience through its brokenness. Sometimes our breaking is God's way of getting our attention. Making it clear that we've got to go in a direct, different direction, do things in a different way, look at things with a different perspective. Now we can choose to be like angry sheep. Still snapping at God, still complaining about the raw deal that others have given us, still whining and crying about the unfairness of life and the rough side of the mountain we have to claim. But what a difference it makes when we come to ourselves and realize that this breaking, this discipline is but the grace of a God who will gladly make me pay now so I don't have to pay more later. Broken. Brokenness, 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 brokenness. And, and then brokenness can be a way of God getting us out of our sort of self-centered way of thinking. <laughs> it's God's way of making us look up to the hills. There was an earthquake a number of years ago in a small remote village. And, and while everybody else was running around, there was a sister sitting in the center of the village. And, and, and she was just smiling. And there was a sort of joy in her face. And somebody said, Mother, don't you understand what's happening? She said, I know, I know, I know. I know these things that we've made will fall. I know that some of these things we made will come down. But it just warms me to know that I serve a God who can shake the world. <laughs> he, he, he can shake the world. He can shake the world. He can shake the world. Sometimes it takes a breaking 
to get us to move beyond the bellhop blessing giving God to whom we turn like children who only thank God for the fun and the good times in their lives and whine about all the problems and the difficulty. That's okay when you're a young child, but it won't do when you're old enough to put away childish things. You've got to get to know a big God, a universe-making, world-shaking, earthquaking, breathtaking, awesome, fresh, and loving God. And not just every now and then, but on a day-by-difficult-day basis. You haven't passed the test until you're willing to stay right where you are forever, as long as God stays there with you. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. There's a story told about a rabbi was asked a question by a pupil referring to Deuteronomy 6.6 6, in which the Lord God says to the people of Israel, and these words which I command thee shall be upon thy heart. Why is it said that way, the pupil said? Why aren't we told to put them in our heart? And the rabbi answered, it's not within our power to place the teachings of God directly in our heart. All we can do is place them on the surface so that when the heart breaks, they drop in. When the heart breaks. When the heart breaks. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part. When God yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a woman that all the world shall be amazed, watch God's methods, watch God's ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How God hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which God only understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How she bends but never breaks when her good God undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with purpose fuses her by each act induces her to try his splendor out. God knows what he's all So my brothers and sisters, in a day and time when every 10 seconds a child is abandoned and neglected, when every 25 seconds a baby is born to unwed parents, when every 60 seconds a child is born to a teen mother, when every three minutes a young person is arrested for doing drugs and every four minutes a young person is arrested for an alcohol-related offense, in a day, when every 100 minutes a child is killed by gunfire and every four hours a child commits suicide, you are the frontline troops and you're blessed with this privilege and I can assure you that you're going to go through some brokenness, some brokenness, some brokenness. You're the body of Christ. And so you've got to be like the head who was blessed. Angels bowed before him. Heaven and earth adored him. All the wisdom of the Godhead was in him. He was the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He had a relationship of love going with the Father back to the very beginning. He was King of kings and Lord of lords. He was blessed. But the head was also broken for your sake and my sake. He was born to poor parents named Mary and Joseph. His nursery was a stable. His cradle was a manger. His birth attendants were sheep and goats. He lived in a ghetto called Nazareth. It was so rough over there that when Philip told Nathaniel that the Messiah was Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Broken, he was a prophet without honor in his own country. His own family called him crazy, and the religious people of his day said he was a demon-possessed cult leader. Broken, he was betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, 
deserted by his disciples, framed by the Sanhedrin, and unjustly condemned by the Romans. Broken, he was tortured by soldiers, spat upon by his fellow countrymen, and forced to carry the instrument of his own death. Broken, he was stripped, and the little clothing that he had was given away in a lottery. Broken, he was gouged by thorns, torn by nails pounded through his hands, and he was then hung out to dry in the hot Palestinian sun. Broken, he was rejected, he was taunted by the thieves on either side of him. His dignity, his respect, his reputation were tattered and thrown. Broken, and then to cap it off, he died from a heart that was broken by our hypocrisy and broken by our sin and broken by our despair and by our sickness. But because he was willing to be broken, all oh, power was given to us and because he was willing to be broken on the third day God rose him up from the dead because he was willing to be broken lives could be saved worlds could be redeemed empires could be brought down the justice of God could be brought to an unjust world because he was willing to be broken But you've just seen the beginning of what God wants to do through you. And I can assure you that you're blessed and you're broken. God's giving you away. I want to ask you to bow your heads for a moment with me. Lord, I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters men and women of God who across this country are doing an awesome work for the kingdom of God. I want to thank you for men and women who have had the privileges I have of living in this season when God is doing some of the most amazing miraculous things in human history. I want to thank you for the way that the gospel is spreading throughout the world in ways it never has before. I want to thank you for the way in which, like a wildfire, men and women across this world are saying yes to Jesus Christ as Lord. I want to thank you for the way in which, even in this country, so overrun with the gospel on the radio, that while, God, there's been a time when people's ears were closed, when familiarity bred contempt, I thank you that the desperation and the coming to the end of our own ways is opening up hearts and minds and ears. Now I thank you for these, your people, who stand on the front lines of ministry and who are enormously gifted and blessed. And yet God are also struggling with their brokenness. Pray that, Lord, from this night forward and the days to come, we would allow you to mold us and make us and shape us so that we might be given away to your world for your glory. For your glory. For your glory. I just want to take a moment to ask if there's anyone who would like to come forward so that we might stand with you and pray with you. you, you you've got enormous work to go back to. And you don't want to go back the same way that you came. You came burdened. You want to go back with the yoke of Jesus. He said, my burden is easy. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You came troubled. You came feeling like maybe you wanted to give up. 
I just want to have an opportunity to encourage you, to pray with you, to have other youth workers, people who share that vision with you, to stand and encourage you. The work that you are doing is so critical to the kingdom of God, so important, so crucial. It's not only that you're raising up that next generation, but, 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 but you are making the difference in our cities across this nation. You're pulling young people back from the brink. You're foiling and undoing what the enemy wants to do. The one who comes to kill and steal and destroy. And he wants more than anything to undermine you and discourage you. So I just for a brief moment want to open the altar. If you'd like to come, just want to pray with you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou be. Waiting not and waiting not to rid my soul, rid my soul of one dark blot, of one dark to thee whose blood, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, cleanse. It's by all of God I come. I come. One more time, just as I am. Just as. come with grateful hearts today because we know we're blessed, God. We know we're blessed. We know we're blessed. We know, we know, we know. We know, God, that we're not speaking into the air, God. We, we, we know, we know. 
We know, God, that this isn't a psychological exercise designed to help us through tough times. God, we know. We know. We know. We know. You, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. We know. We know. We know we're blessed. We know we're blessed. We know. We know that we're blessed. We know, God, that we've been anointed, and we know that we've been appointed, and we know that we've been called to this work of ministry. Sometimes we don't know why, but we know, we know, we know, we know. And we've seen what you've done, God, with the little that we have, we know, we've seen the changes in lives. We know the difference that it made in our life because somebody stood in the place that we are now standing for somebody else, God. We know that we're here tonight because mothers wore out their knees, because fathers wore out their knees, because grandmothers and grandfathers and great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers knelt down sometimes on dirt floors and prayed for their children and their children's children and their children's children's children. We know that we're blessed. We know that we're blessed. We know that we're blessed. We know about the accidents, God, that should have taken our lives, God. We know about the drugs that should have done us in. We know, we know. We know, God, that it's by your grace and by your mercy that we are here today. And we're confident of the fact, Lord, that your spirit, in spite of us, is doing a marvelous thing in us and through us and to us and around us. That's why we're here at Kingdom Works, God. Because we know the kingdom works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know that we're blessed tonight. We're coming here tonight, Lord, because we also know that we're broken. We're broken, we're broken, we're broken, we're broken. We're broken, we're broken, we're broken, God. We're, we're hurting in some places, God. We're discouraged in some places. We're despairing in some places, God. We're broken. Broken because we don't know where we'll find the strength to carry on. Broken because in spite of our best efforts, God, it seems like there are places we keep slipping back into and sins we have trouble departing away from. We're broken today, God. Because there's some thorns that the enemy has planted in our lives long time ago. And they're starting to bear that bitter fruit, Lord. We're broken. We're broken. We're broken. We know that the sufficiency is not of us, God. It's about you in us because we see our brokenness. But God, we kneel before you today because we believe your word when you said that what the enemy intends for evil, you're working out for good. You're working it 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 out for good. You're working. You know the way that we take, God. And you love us enough not to let us slide and get by, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You see sometimes in us, God, what we don't see in ourselves. But we thank you, Lord, that you've put us in some tough places. We thank you that you've had us walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We thank you for the desert places where the ravens have had to feed us, oh God, and the brook of Kerith has been the only water that we've known. We thank you for it. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. For those times when, like Elijah, we felt all by ourselves, only to hear you say, oh no, I've got 5,000 who've not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not forsaken. Though you walk through the river, it's not going to overflow you. Though you pass through the fire, it's not going to consume you. You're not by yourself because the God who called you has determined even through your brokenness to bring you to a greater place so that he might give you a way. So I pray today, God, for these my brothers and sisters as they kneel in your presence. And I thank you that the words that have been spoken here at Kingdom Works, God, will bear rich fruit in their lives. That as we come into a new millennium, Lord, and a generation of young people, oh God, who have faced stresses and strains perhaps never before seen, 
that these are your miracle workers, God. And we take authority over all that the enemy would try to do in their lives and declare that they are anointed and protected by your spirit, God. Now, God, may the assurance of their calling and the assurance of your presence keep their hearts and minds and equip them for the ministry to which you've called them. In Jesus' name, let the people of God say, Amen. Hallelujah.